Steve Barry is back with his 18th novel featuring Cotton Malone. The Atlas Maneuver involves gold hidden in 1945 and its connection to a present-day international financial threat using cryptocurrency. And it's up to Cotton Malone to save the world. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Ahead, I'll talk with Steve Barry about this latest novel, The Atlas Maneuver. I requested and was provided with a copy of the book, but this video is not sponsored. Steve Barry is the New York Times and number one internationally best-selling author of 18 Cotton Malone novels, five standalone thrillers, two Luke Daniels adventures, and several works of short fiction. Steve, welcome to Some Books Considered. Great, man. Thanks for having me here. Now, for those who aren't familiar with this series of books, tell us about Cotton Malone. Well, he's a retired Justice Department agent. He lives in Copenhagen. He owns an old bookshop, and he kind of gets into trouble all the time. Uh, he's not a Daniel Craig kind of guy. He's not that kind of look or feel. He's more a George Clooney kind of guy. He's an ordinary guy that, you know, you, you wouldn't think could do what he does, but then he, when called upon, he can do extraordinary things. And I think that's what really made him popular is that he is an ordinary kind of guy. And he's had a lot of adventures. This is his 18th. The great thing is readers should not be put off by that. They're not required to read the other 17 first. Uh, you can jump into the series any way you want and pick it up however you want. I write them that way on purpose. So he's, uh, he's done good for me. I've enjoyed having him, and I hope he stays around for a long time. Well, as you mentioned, this is the 18th novel to feature him. And you touched on this a bit already, but tell us a little bit more about why this character has continued to hold your interest as an author. Well, I like exploring things with him. In every novel, I always explore an aspect of his personality that I've never explored before. So each one has that element to it. This book deals with regret. And he has to deal with a regret, a great regret from his past that comes back right there in his face. He never saw it coming. It's just boom, there it is. And he's got to deal with something that he's never dealt with before. So I've had fun with that, making sure I deal with something different in each book of his personality. And this book has a surprise in it, and it's going to set up some things that's going to happen down the road in some future books. But I, for me, he still stays fresh. I still, I still like him and, and enjoy him. And like I said, I, I don't want him to go away anytime soon. So how would you say he has matured or evolved over the course of those 18 novels? Oh, there's definitely a difference. If you read The Templar Legacy, the first Cotton Malone book, you read this book, you, there's a difference in how he thinks, how he acts. He's much more patient now. He's much more... Uh, introspective. He was not a. He was not much into that before because he has Cassiopeia Vit now, so he has a little bit of a love interest in his life. Women is not his strong point. He doesn't do well with women, so he, it's hard for him. It's hard. Emotions are hard for him, but they're hard for her too. So they're kind of made for one another. And he's he's begun to realize that he may need somebody where he before he would have said, "I don't need anybody. I can do this. I don't need anything." So he's. He's gotten better. Now, I won't say he's gotten older because I quit aging him about 10 books ago. So he, he doesn't age much anymore, but he does evolve and change. And you've got to do that. Otherwise, the books become stale. They become stale for the reader and they become stale for me. Well, tell us about the plot of this book, The Atlas Maneuver. Well, it deals with two things that always have fascinated me that I've been wanting to write about for a long time. One is Yamashita's Gold which is a treasure from World War II that was hidden by the Japanese in the Philippines. Uh, an enormous amount of gold hidden, hidden, hidden in 175 underground vaults. Some of it was found by the American intelligence community after the war, and some say it was used for some very nefarious purposes, something called the Black Eagle Trust. Um, we don't know for sure. We don't know, we don't know one way or the other for that, which is perfect for me. So I brought that treasure forward to now, and I deal with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a subject that I knew nothing about. I spent about six months reading a lot about it. I had a gentleman who was very knowledgeable in it who taught me about it. 
And the reader is going to get a pretty good understanding of Bitcoin from this novel. I wanted I wanted you to leave the novel with that understanding. This may be the first thriller that I'm aware of where Bitcoin is the plot. It's not just thrown in there. It is the entire plot. The Atlas Maneuver deals with Bitcoin. And it's just an interesting subject. And in those these two came together nicely, this thing from the past and this thing from the present, and they melded together to form a really good thriller. And speaking of things from the past, for Cotton Malone, there's a woman from his past that surfaces mm-hmm. in this book that is wildly complicated for him. She has a lot of useful information, but she also carries a lot of emotional baggage for him. A lot, a lot. And she, and she reignites inside of him these regrets that he had from you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago, things that he thought he had put aside never to see again. And boom, there she is out of nowhere. And he has to deal with it and he has to come to grips with it. And, and it's difficult for him because this is, you know, regret is a tough emotion. And so Cotton doesn't deal with it that often. He dealt with it in the Paris Vendetta a little bit when Henrik Tervalison uh, was killed. He dealt with that a little bit there. But here we fully explore it in great detail. And he has to come to grips and, and deal with something. We all have these things in our past that we may never want to see again. And then what happens when they they come back and then you have to deal with them. You don't have a choice. And that's where Cotton finds himself. I want to come back a little bit to what you were talking about before, because this book spans a a big amount of time from the end of World War II up to the present. As you pointed out, you knew nothing about Bitcoin. So what were some of the challenges that this novel posed for you when it came to the research you needed to do to get those details right? Well, I had to find the some good stuff. I had to find good material. Well, on Bitcoin, there's a zillion books. Luckily, as I said, there's a gentleman in our neighborhood who's very knowledgeable on subject. This is what he does for a living. So he pointed me to some of the definitive works on it. So I was able to read some of the good stuff. And I talked with several people uh, who, are, who are very uh, into the the workings of Bitcoin. I'm not talking about the buying and selling of it. That's one aspect. But how it works, how it functions. I had no idea how any of that worked. And so I had to learn that. Then I had to figure out how to explain that to the reader in very simple terms so that they could grasp it too. And it worked out well because those things became part of the plot. So this book was uh, two things I didn't know a lot about that I had to go learn. And I used about three to 400 sources like I normally do and assembled it together. There's a writer's note in the back that's going to tell you what's true and false. And it'll also point you to a few of those sources that I just talked about if you want to read a little more about it. When you do so much research for a book like this, I imagine you have to strike a balance between all the information you have and could give, but you don't want it to bog down the narrative of the story. No, no, no. The research is about this tall. It's about 19 inches tall, the notes when I get done. I'm only going to use a tiny little fraction of that, maybe just 10 10, 10 to 15 pages of those notes. That's all. Uh, So, But I I put it all together, so I'll have it, so I know where it is. And I have to make those uh, choices along the way. I have to make educated guesses. I have to make uh, on some things where you get conflicting information. And I I just do the best I can with it. The trick in my genre is mixing information with action. That's the hard part. I I don't say that I'm great at it. I just say that I'm aware of it. And I try very hard to make sure that I mix information and action in the right doses. I'm curious about process here. Are are you the kind of author who likes to outline everything? Or do you have a goal in mind and kind of figure it out as you go along? I, I would love to be able to outline the whole book before I start, but that's not possible. I did in the beginning, but I just don't have the time anymore. What I do is while I'm writing the novel before, I outline the first hundred pages of the next book. So I do do that so that when I get started, I'm, I got to wait, I'm going. And then as I write, I try to stay 50 to a hundred pages ahead of myself outlining, but you always write faster than your outline, unfortunately. So you always catch up, always catch up. And, you know, you just learn to catch up and keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, you, I know the ending. I don't know every detail of the ending, but I know what the ending is because 
if I didn't, I wouldn't know where to start. I always tell people, where do you start a book? You start a book as close to the end as possible. So I need to know the end so I can get as close to it as I can. For me, that's about 48 to 72 hours. This book is about uh, three days. This is about a 72 hour book. And so I try to get as close as I can and then bring it in. And then as I go, I kind of discover it along the way. And every once in a while, like the surprise in this novel was not there when I started the book. It came about three quarters of the way in when I went, oh, I know what I can do now. Yeah. So it required a little rewriting in the front, but it, but it came to me and it worked out very well. And um, you have to be flexible in that so you can pivot when you need to. Steve, there's a question I like to ask authors of fiction, and it's this. If you could spend a day in real life with one of the characters from this novel, who would it be and why? Wow. That's a toughie. That is a very good, uh, that's a good question. I never thought about it before. Um, I probably would just, in, in this particular book, I probably would just like to be with Cotton. I wouldn't mind just sitting down with Cotton and, and seeing what he has to say and seeing how he felt about everything and how it was. Um, I don't have a lot of historical folks here. I have General Yamashita, and I guess that would be interesting, but he's not going to tell me anything. I mean, he didn't tell the Americans anything. That's why they tried, convicted, and hung him very quickly and got, got him out of the way. Um, Cotton would probably be the best one to sit down and have some talks with. Normally, I have a lot of historical, more historical figures, but in this book, uh, we did not because we dealt with Yamashita and then we dealt with Bitcoin itself. So I guess I'd probably I'd like to have that conversation with Cotton. Well, you're busy writing your own novels, but when you're not... What do you like to read? Uh, I'm a thriller junkie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like thrillers. I mean, I don't get a chance to read many, maybe four or five. Uh, and I get to write and read. So I, um, James Rollins, Clive Cussler, um, an Grisham book, maybe a Baldacci book here and there, Lee Child book, those kind of things. Uh, I like thrillers. I like good, fast-paced, interesting thrillers. Now, before I let you go, I want to give you a chance to talk about History Matters, which you and your wife founded. Tell us about the work it does and how those uh, writing seminars figure into that mission. Well, we, we created it about uh, 15 years ago to help local communities raise money for historic preservation. We've done about 90 projects around the country, raised about $3 million. Most of the way we raise the money, we go in and we do our writer's workshop. You just mentioned a four-hour workshop. We price it differently depending on the community and you buy your way in with a contribution and all of that money goes to the restoration project. Uh, we'll do dinners, galas, luncheons, all of that money goes to the project. We don't charge to come. We don't charge expenses. We pay our own way to, to come. And then that money goes to whatever we're there to support. And we've done all kinds of things. We've done buildings, cemeteries, books, banners, libraries, you name it. We've raised money for it. Um, we do about two to three projects a year. So if anyone has a project or if any uh, local historical society has a project, they can go to my website, steveberry.org, where you can also learn about the books, but you can also click on History Matters and send me an email and we'll see if we can come help you. And speaking of books, what's next for you? Uh, Luke Daniels will be back June 11th with the second Luke Daniels book called Red Star Falling, which is a great story about Russia and the, well, the lost library of Ivan the Terrible. Then Cotton will be back next year in an adventure called The Medici Return uh, with the Medici family in Tuscany, and he'll be back with Air uh, a year from now. Well, this book is the 18th in the series featuring Cotton Malone. It's The Atlas Maneuver by Steve Barry. Steve, thank you for talking with me today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Now, if you'd like to purchase The Atlas Maneuver, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.